Well, a big welcome to all of those who are joining us today on our online location. Welcome. God bless you. We love you. A big welcome to Melbourne this morning. We love you, Melbourne. It's great to be with you uh, there in the Karalika Centre. We love every single one of you sending our thoughts, our prayers are with you right now. That Someone told me it's, it's potentially snowing on the outskirts of Melbourne. So whether it's 35 degrees like it was here yesterday or whether it's snowing, God is good. He loves you and He's here gathering with us wherever we are from around the world today. Uh, I, I really want to say firstly that Danielle and I deeply appreciate your prayers. I know you pray for us on a regular basis. I uh, really covet your prayers for the next few weeks. The next few weeks are very significant weeks for us where we are leading up to a national conference of pastors. The first time that our pastors have been able to gather. They'll be gathering here on the Sunshine Coast uh, at, towards the end of April. It will be the, the uh, week where we hand over the leadership of C3 Australia. Australia. And so we'll be handing that over to a great couple called Lars and Megas and Halverson from Darwin uh, that will allow us to focus more on our C3 global responsibilities. But it's a big time. So we really, really appreciate your prayers. You can be seated right now. Melbourne, you can be seated. Here at the coast, you can be seated. At home, if you stood up, which probably you didn't, but you can stay seated. Or if you're in your car, stay seated as well. That's just a, just a little tip. If you're on the bus, on your, on your iPhone, just stay seated right now. That will, that will help us. Hey, uh, we're going to hear uh, right now from an awesome man of God about what God has done in his life. We love to share uh, uh, with each other the, the, the things that God does and how he transforms us and it's miraculous. So I want to welcome up a great man. His name's Michael Lassen. And he's, I love watching God's transformation of Lass's life, Michael's life. Why don't you share with us a bit of what God's done for you, mate? Uh, hey guys, I'm Michael, aka known as uh, Lass. I have a beautiful partner, Tay, a son, Arlo, who loves coming to the church with me every second Sunday. I own my own electrical business that services across the whole state of Queensland and northern New South Wales. My life before church was something I used to be super proud of. It involved my anger being super aggressive and I enjoyed it over the top party lifestyle that I used to live for every weekend. I used to abuse cocaine and alcohol like it was just part of my everyday lifestyle. And I used to play football on the weekends where I thought I always had to portray the big tough guy because that's all I'd ever known. So I come to a point where I had uh, reached out an all time low in my life when my ex partner slept with me, my best mate, and it was uh, close to Christmas. I was sitting in a hospital bed all alone, and I reached out to Bianca in Siena, and um, I'm actually tearing up now. I was, I was tearing up while I was writing it too. And I was um, asked whether God is there and if God could help me as I needed to give it a try. Uh, God has changed my life so, so far that is honestly beyond crazy. After reaching out to Bianca in Siena and coming to church for the first Sunday I was out of hospital, I Im immediately felt such a presence of God that this knew, I knew this is where I needed to be and I needed to open my heart to start my journey. After I gave my heart to God, I felt inside me that Alpha was my next step from bettering my understanding in God and making my relationship with Him even stronger. After completing Alpha, I made some of the most amazing long life friendships and it led me to one of the best moments of my entire church journey, which was the night I got baptised. After this, after this moment, I instantly felt a feeling of relief and freedom where I felt that everything in my past had left me and it was this moment onwards that my life with God was more amazing than ever. My, now, my life now with God in it is seriously the most wonderful feeling knowing that He's with me every single day. Isaac and Sienna have played such a huge role in my church journey as Isaac is someone I look up to as my role model and someone I aspire to be like more every day. While with the help of his beautiful wife Sienna and my beautiful, beautiful partner Tay, have given me and shown me the utmost incredible support throughout my whole journey has ultimately made me my journey that much better. I just want to let everyone know that everyone is good enough for church. Never think you're not. I said to myself I never would be and I'd never be accepted. But if you give your heart to God, you will feel so blessed and your life will change forever. Thank you. 
Well done. Come on, Michael, AKA Lass. Thank you for sharing your story. Come on, let's give Jesus a hand for what he does. Thank you, Michael, sharing so powerfully with us with us today. Fantastic. Ben, you can go. You've done a great job. We're going to release uh, those of you in the music team. Put your hands together for, for them today. Next Sunday, Michael just talked about baptism being an incredible powerful moment in his journey and next Sunday both in Melbourne and here we are going to on the Sunshine Coast we're going to be celebrating uh, water baptism so I want to encourage you if you haven't taken that step it will be a game changer you just got to got to do it a little bit afraid sometimes a little bit it's a step of faith a step of obedience but God will honor that powerful powerful step we don't we're good Excellent. We, we, we feel good. We feel like we're doing, we feel like we're doing really well. Just, I, I, just a couple of little things to help you uh, get into the spirit of this uh, series that I'm about to launch. Uh, with, we're beginning a four-week series called The Matters of the Heart. Matters of the Heart. This is a series. I believe you're, so that many people are going to look back at the end of this year or even in five years' time and go, that series opened my eyes to a truth that I did not realize and helped me radically change from the inside out. Matters of the heart. We're going to be throughout all of our connect groups throughout the second term going to be discussing this four-week series. You'll be watching uh, little bits of the messages and discussing how it's applying into our life as we apply it and go on a journey together. You're going to absolutely love it. First of all, just want to tell you a couple of little really important things. I used to get heartburn when I ate my birthday cake until my doctor advised me to make sure I take the candles off first. Now, come on, that's not too bad. That's, that, that's not too bad. Uh, I've got a friend who's a cardiologist. It's a little weird, but he always sends me these echograms and, and ultrasounds of his heart. Uh, and it's unusual, but at least we all know his heart's in the right place. Yeah, okay, all right. There we go, here we go. The most famous heart in Australia. In year seven, when I did the compulsory school trip to Canberra, we visited the National Library and everyone, the number one inquiry at the National Library they talk about is Farlap's heart. I don't know if you've ever seen Farlap's heart. I've seen it or a, a version of it, as some people say. And it's a, a massive heart. Uh, it, it weighed at around six and a half kilograms, which is twice the, the weight of any ordinary, uh, any ordinary horse or one and a half times a normal thoroughbred horse. And Farlap was an Aussie legend. I actually saw the, the stuffed version of Farlap. I think 19 or 17 hands, right, massive, massive horse. A horse that, okay, he did come from New Zealand, a little bit like Russell Crowe and all those other good things. That, but he's an Aussie horse, just to be really clear. We're, we're claiming him and good things come from New Zealand that Aussies claim, Pavlova's another, but there's lots of them. And he, he, he actually lost nine of his first 10 races, but he went on and won, uh, I think, the next 36 of 41, establishing himself as an Aussie legend. And they say that one of the keys to his success was his heart. It was the, the size and the, in, and the strength of his heart. And when we, you and I talk about hearts, we've got so many expressions uh, in our culture relating to the heart. There's a, there's a person, and I reckon, Michael, you'd be one of these. He wears his heart in his sleeve. That's an expression we use. Someone, you know what's going on on the inside because they're a demonstrative, expressive person. Or you might say about that person who's generous, oh, they've got a big heart. Uh, you, might, you might talk about, I broke up with my girlfriend or my boyfriend and I was heartbroken. Uh, or we talk about after a, a good experience uh, and, and where people have said kind words or you've just had a lovely time with people and there's this connection going on and you go, my heart is full. Have you ever, have you ever said that? I turned 50 this year. Lots of people said nice things to me and about me and I came out of it for the next month going, my heart is full. I feel, I feel good. Uh, I've quite, quite humorously through, throughout uh, COVID, when COVID first broke, I got a number of emails and I feel like somebody got this off a sort of a prototype of how to tell people that the business is closed or this thing's not happening and, and it would open with a letter, with a heavy heart, I want to inform you. Which made sense in a lot of cases. I got one from the dentist and I thought, now that's a little inappropriate. With a heavy heart, I have to cancel your appointment. I'm like, that's not a heavy heart. That is good news. I'm not going to the dentist. 
Then we sing songs. Oh, there are hundreds of songs about the heart. Uh, Don't go breaking my heart, Elton John. Uh, the Titanic movie. I know some of you, you want, you want to sing it right now. My heart will go on. I'm not going to sing it. I'm going to spare you. The classic biblical song from the 1992 by Billy Ray Cyrus, Achy Breaky Heart. Don't break my heart. Anyway, I won't sing that to you either. But our world has a fascination with our heart, and rightly so. The text for this series, Matters of the Heart, that I want to refer uh, that I want to refer to, and it is the memory verse of the week, is out of Proverbs chapter four, verse twenty-three. And let's put that up on the screen, and you can get a photo of it and grab a hold of it. And it goes like this: Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. Keep your heart with all diligence. For out of it spring the issues of life. Uh, and the NLT says it like this. It's while you're getting a photo of that and saving it to your phone to memorize scripture. Uh, the NLT says this, guard your heart above all else. Interesting. Above all else, guard your heart. Uh, for it determines the course of your life. It determines the course of your life. This is, this is a fascinating scripture to me. So often people would say it like this, well, life is what's happening to you. So if life's going good for me, then I'll be happy. But the Bible tells us, no, it's not like that. It's the other way around. Life is flowing out from you. Life is coming out of your heart. You can put two different people in exactly the same external circumstances and one will be, will be joyful and happy and content and another will be complaining and, and, and worried and anxious and you go, what's the difference? It's the condition of the heart. Because life flows out of our heart, it doesn't flow towards us. So I'd like to suggest, based on that scripture, that the condition of your heart and the condition of my heart will actually determine the quality and the direction of my life. The quality and direction. Another version of that scripture says this, uh, for out of your heart spring the boundaries of your life. The limitations of our life are not what other people are putting on us. It's not what other people are saying about us. It's not, about, it's not about our circumstances right now. The limitation on our life are actually in our heart. And that's why above all else, paying attention to our heart is extremely, extremely important. Now, I've spent a little bit of time this week uh, looking into the science of the heart. Uh, Isaac Sansom, who uh, last referred to, who's a, a training doctor and a, a qualified scientist in our church, who'll do a, a message here uh, this month on the Sunshine Coast. We, we began to talk about the heart and how physically the heart works. And I looked at a number of science things. And, and what was fascinating to me, and it's so often the case, is how science has eventually caught up with the truth of the Bible. Eventually, psychologists used to think that our emotions were purely mental expressions. They were purely generated from our brain. That's what they would, they would tell us. Therefore, if you could just control the thoughts in your mind, you would control uh, your feelings. However, science has proven that's difficult. There's a constant two-way dialogue between our heart, our physical heart, and our brain. Uh, our emotions change, and this, this is what happens. Our emotions change. We encounter something, and our heart actually first encounters it, and it sends a signal to our brain. And so our heart might encounter something that, that, that triggers fear inside of us. Because when, when we're triggered, that's in our heart. Triggers fear inside of us. Our heart beat will get erratic. That actually is part of sending a signal to our mind to engage the, uh, the cort- the, our brain, the fight or fight part of our brain, and release cortisol. So it's like I get triggered in my heart. A message goes to my brain. My brain tells my body how to work. And there's this interplay between the heart and the brain, but it's actually the heart sending more signals to the brain than the other way around. So when we have feelings in our heart like anger, frustration, anxiety, insecurity, 
our heart rhythms become erratic and that sends a signal to our brain to release cortisol, which is that stress syndrome and, and fight or flight. And so suddenly we're feeling and that sends more back messages back to our heart and suddenly our whole world changes, not just because of our thoughts, but because of our heart. So your heart's important. The Bible says to guard it, to look after it, and to pay attention to it. All right. So let's. So at the end of each one of these four weeks series that we're going to do, I want to encourage you, if you're able, to be with us every Sunday for the next four weeks because it will build on itself. At the end of each uh, a service, we're going to give what I would call heart work, not homework, heart work. Some things to go away because this is not just a message to hear. This is a message to get the skills and the spirit of how I guard and look after my heart. Some people like to imagine it like this. Your heart is the garden of your life that, and everything flows out of it. So we need to tend to the garden of our heart. We need to pay it. We need to weed out some things. We need to fertilize some things. We need to water some things. And this is our heart. Our heart is vitally, vitally important. Are we good? So I want to just, today I'm going to introduce uh, some, some concepts that are important for us to understand. I'm going to land us getting some heart work to do, which we'll practice in this service, and then it'll be a daily homework and heart work, something to talk about in Connect Group, and then we'll go from there. We're going to deep dive into the matters and issues of the heart. Are you ready to go? Let's go. Just give me a yes and an amen. Melbourne, give me a yes and an amen. Online, just put in, I'm ready to go. And here we go. All right, the first thing I want us to know, this is really important, is your inner life is more important than your physical life. Give me an amen if you're with me, otherwise I'm going to convince you as we go. Your inner life is more important than your physical life. Now we had this conversation at our family dinner table this week. Our, uh, one of the, our uh, children raised this uh, conversation. They said, oh, I heard that uh, uh, that guy has, has been back to the gym. And she said, oh, she, she said, okay, now I've given it away. She said he's getting pretty bulky. And, I'm like, and so it began this conversation. We're like, I'm not sure you'd say he's getting bulky because that might have wrong connotations with it. Began this whole conversation in our family. Are uh, you better to say he's bulky or he's bulked up? And so we, we landed on, you better to say he bulked up. Uh, we, we, we talked about what's a unit. So, so, so again, she said, oh, so-and-so was described as a unit. What's a unit? And so eventually, as we talked, a unit is a big, boned, muscly person uh, who's not flabby, but well-built and strong, who you don't want running at you on the football field. Because if they run at you, they're going to run over the top of you and they're going to hurt you because there are, there are units. Okay, this is just really important. I'm just helping some people today, okay? I was educating my daughter. I, I like to, for example, if people talk about my body type, I'm not bulky or bulked up or a unit. I'm quite confident with that, but I'm not skinny. I'm lean. That's just important, okay? Don't call me skinny. Call me lean. Lean yet muscular. That's just the, that's the way that I like to be referred of my body type. Just, just to be clear, uh, I, someone in my family said I'm not muscle, as my, well, my daughter, she, she's like, I'm not muscly, I'm toned. Just language is important, okay, in describing the physical world. And we live in a world that is obsessed with the external, yeah. obsessed with the physical world. In fact, so, more, often, the obsession with the physical is to cover up something painful that's on the inside. And the Bible talks about your inside life. Last Sunday night here, I interviewed a few people and one of them was a, a great man in our church called Matt who's here today. And Matt was actually a, a gym. He was, was a unit and probably still is a unit just to be clear, okay. Uh, but he was super muscly running gyms and, and, and people would look at him on the outside with his good smile, a handsome body, muscular, and you'd go, that guy, he's got a great life. Yet someone in our church, as they passed him at the gym, went past him and didn't realize, but he was literally looking up on the internet how to take wow. his own life. Wow. Wow. That's because he was more concerned at that point with his outer life than his inner life. Wow. But if you pay more attention, now your outer life's important, don't get me wrong. It's good to be, look after your physical body. We're stewards of our physical body. That is important. But it's not as important as your inner life. 
And so fortunately, Matt was able to meet this great guy in our church called Shorty and go on a journey and realize that it's my inner world that's really important. Bible talks about this in 1 Thessalonians. It says, uh, now that may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and make your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. It just, this gives us the idea that we are a three-part being, like God who's a trinity, we're a three-part being. We are a spirit who has a soul who lives in a body. Okay, we're, we're three parts. And your inner man, okay, in the, again, some scripture. Remember, I'm laying some foundations today. Right. Ephesians 3.16 says this, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his Holy Spirit in the inner man, right. the inner man. Right. So you have a physical man, right. and I'm using the man in a non-generic sense of the word, like in a more generic sense of the word. You have a physical man and you have an inner man. It's, it's, so your inner, your inner person and your outer person. And so your inner person is a mirror of your physical person. I like to sometimes think of it like this, that my physical body is the hardware, but my inner body is the software, right. my inner person. And so you might have heard it expressed like this, uh, you, you have a physical brain but your inner man is your mind, right, right. your mind, your mind and your brain, and they're interconnected. So when you die one day, you will leave behind a physical body, and that physical body will have a physical brain, and it will have a physical heart. But you, your inner man, and that's your spirit and soul together make up your inner man, you will still exist. You will still, your inner man will still have a heart. Your inner man will still have a mind. Right. It'll have lost the hardware, but it will still be you. That's you who will live for eternity. And what you do on earth will determine what happens to you, the person, when you die, to your spirit and your soul, which is your inner man. Are you with me so far? Therefore, your inner man has a heart and a mind. A heart and a mind. And some of you may have heard of some of the research that goes around your mind because your mind interplays with your brain. And so you might have heard someone like Dr. Carolyn Leaf. You might have heard uh, a, a great pastor in America has just written a new book, Craig Rochelle, about the power of your thoughts and your, your mind. And they'll talk about the chemistry, the, that literally when you go to work on your, the thoughts in your mind, right. new neural pathways will be created. There literally will be right. your thoughts your mind's thoughts will affect your brain's chemistry because they're interrelated. And I want to suggest to you today, just as your mind's thoughts affect your physical and vice versa, your physical neural pathways, your heart's thoughts and the way you're wired and, and your emotions of your heart have a re direct connection to your physical heart. In fact, there is a condition called broken heart syndrome where a person can have the symptoms of like a heart attack, but it's not a physical heart attack, it's not the hardware, it's a direct relation to an emotional event that causes the symptoms of a heart attack because of this interplay between the inner man's heart and our physical heart. Are you with me today? So paying attention to our inner person, our inner world is vital and important. You can still be a unit, but pay attention to your inner man or your inner person. Okay, that's the first thought I want us to get today. The second thought that I want us to have today is this, is that true transformation happens firstly on the inside. Now, of course, the body and soul and spirit, they all interplay and they all interreact. But your true transformation happens on the inside. I loved as Michael shared his story with us this morning of coming to the end of himself, of his party lifestyle and the pain in his heart, the broken heart, the things that had happened. And so much of that party lifestyle was probably dealing with issues of the heart because that's so often why we act out. We're trying to escape from the issues. The things, heart issues are frustration, anger, grief, hurt, disappointment. These are all the issues and the matters of the heart. And so, so when, we, when we don't deal with those heart, we, those issues, we look to escape from them. We look to, we look to numb the pain. 
We look to escape from the pain. We look, we look to either go crazy or, or be super successful or find our identity in our external life where God wants us to find our identity in our heart with Him. And so transformation happens. I believe transformation happens on four levels. The first is your spirit. When, and the greatest transformation moment that a person will ever have is connecting to Jesus, letting God come into our life and make us literally a new creation. If any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. That's the born again experience where spiritually I become a spiritual new creation. And then this is what happens. God begins to live in our heart. God comes and he dwells. So it says that for, for this In 2 Corinthians, let's jump right down, verses 1 to 22. He has identified us as his own by placing the Holy Spirit where? In our hearts. As the first installment that guarantees everything he has promised us. So we become a new creation. Ezekiel's a prophecy about this. I'll give you a new heart and I'll put a new spirit in you. I'll take out or deal with your stony, stubborn heart and I'll give you a tender heart responsive heart. This is what God wants to do for you and I. Not have us have a hard heart, a heart we're disconnected from, a heart that's angry, but a tender, loving, responsive heart. And it's a work of the Holy Spirit. He says, I'll I'll put my spirit in you so that you will follow my decrees and be careful to obey my regulations. I'll put my spirit in you. When you become a Christian, two powerful things happen instantly. One, You become a new creation spiritually with the DNA of Jesus. You're no longer the same person trying to be a better person. You're a different person with a different different genetic spiritual code, that of Jesus. And his Holy Spirit comes and lives in our heart. That's now where he dwells. And he begins the work of transformation as, our, as we grow spiritually. We get delivered from demons. That's spiritual. Our spirit grows. That's spiritual. That's the first part. But then God goes to work on our heart. Jesus said, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the good news and to what? To heal the brokenhearted. Once you've got the good news, you can be saved. Then what God does is he begins to work on our heart to heal the broken. Hearted. And then out of healing our broken heart, he, the Bible talks about he begins, he, he, and he does these things simultaneously. It's not, like, it's not like this. Okay, you get born again, you grow your spirit. We deal with the demons. That's that phase. You never have to worry about that. Then I'll go to work on your heart and we'll do that for five or seven years and, and then I'll renew your mind and, and then you can change your behavior. In 15 t- years time, you can start focusing on your behavior. No. Simultaneously, spiritually born again, getting free, God's working in my heart, my mind is being renewed, and my behavior is being transformed. Now, that, that is good news. This, I, I, just, I, I love to paint the picture to make, be clear because if we go, oh, I'm going to become a new person, a better person, so often we go, behavior. What I do and say. If I can fix what I do and say, then I'll be good. But God says, no, it's all of these things. It's spiritual it's heart, it's mind, and it's behavior, words and actions. And, it's, and you can't excuse your behavior because you go, oh, don't worry about my behavior. That doesn't really matter what I say. Because yes, it does because it's flowing out of your heart. So I'm going to fix your heart at the same time as working on your behavior. Are we, are we making sense today? So here's the, here's the first thing, and here's your first bit of heart work. The first bit of heart work. Romans chapter 5 verse 5 says this, Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. I think this is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. I probably pray this almost every day. God, would you pour your love into my heart by your Holy Spirit? That's that's his first job when he lives in your heart. The Spirit of God's first job now that he lives in your heart. And if he doesn't yet live in your heart, if you've never asked God to come into your life, in a few moments there's going to be a chance to do that. It will change everything. It will transform you. But the first thing that happens when the Holy Spirit lives in your heart, the Bible says his job is to change your heart so you connect to God as a father. You cry out, Abba Father, Daddy God, God you're amazing. And he pours love into your heart. So here's, here's your first bit of heart work slash homework. 
is to start to pray this simple prayer every day. Holy Spirit, would you pour God's love into my heart? Would you pour God's love into my heart? I have a ritual in my day, and I've had it for a long time, where I choose a song, a worship song, that relates to the theme of God pouring his love into my heart, and I'll play it, and I'll slow everything down, and I'll pray this prayer. Holy Spirit, would you pour the Father's love into my heart? And I'll begin to meditate and think on the thought of God's love for me. And, and I'm, I'm, my, my brain, which thinks and it gets distracted and everything's going on is one level, but a deeper level is my heart. And my heart thinks, I'm gonna to get to that in a moment. My heart has thoughts as well as my brain having thoughts. Right. My heart's thoughts are the deeper thoughts. And so I'm asking God to pour his love into my heart and I'm asking that he'll do that for you. Can I get a keyboardist to come on up, both in Melbourne or a guitarist and a keyboardist here, if you would come on up. The third thing and I want to, the last point I want to get to us today is this. So we know this, that our inner life's more important than our external life. Our inner man's more important than our outer man. We know this, that transformation happens firstly on the inside, but it's spiritual, heart, mind, and behavior. Those are the four key levels of transformation. And the third thing I want us to know is this, what you think about in your heart matters. And this might be a new thought to some people. What do you mean what I think about in my heart? Don't I think with my mind? Yeah, you do. But you also think in your heart. You can see a sign and your brain thinks about that and your brain thinks about that and your brain looks at that light and your brain looks at that person and your mind is engaging through your eyes around the room. But simultaneously, I can see a man here whose name's Ian Dimon and I can see him, I go, nice shirt, great, I like his brown shoes, that's my mind. But my heart has a feeling associated with my connection to Ian Dimon. My heart tells me he's kind. My heart tells me he's encouraging. My heart tells me he's a great person to talk to and engage with. My, that's, that's my heart. My mind's telling me he's wearing a mask today. That's a bit random. There's, there's, there's these two levels. You might refer to it as the conscious and subconscious. And we interact with the world through the thoughts of our heart. And those thoughts in our heart have been written there or locked in there over a period of time through experiences, through upbringing, positive experiences, negative experiences, things that have been spoken over you, things that have been spoken over me. They have shaped my heart. Anxious thoughts in my heart, loving thoughts, critical thoughts of others, encouraging thoughts. They, they all can exist in our heart. Guilt and shame are issues of the heart. Joy is a matter of the heart. These are, these are things that flow out. So looking after our hearts is really important. The Bible tells us, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart, what my heart thinks about, David says, let it be acceptable to you, God. Jesus said to some of the Pharisees, why are you thinking evil thoughts in your heart? Jesus said, if someone looks at that woman, that's look, brain, but then commits adultery with her in his heart or thinks lustfully about her and imagines things, that is as bad as doing it in God's eye because our heart is as important as our external world. What I'm imagining, what I'm meditating on, what I'm thinking about matters to God. In fact, what I'm imagining, pondering, thinking about, spending time playing out in my imagination, which is part of my heart's activity, will actually determine the condition of my heart. And if it determines the condition of my heart, the direction and quality of my life flows out of what I spend my time meditating on. So you go, 
Right now in our world, mental health is a massive challenge. I would say mental health, maybe not quite the right word because it's actually heart and mind health. And if the world is obsessed with devices and escape and thinking about trying not to think but flooding all this stuff into our thoughts and our heart, it will determine the condition of our life, what I'm meditating about, what I'm thinking about. So as well as letting the Holy Spirit come in and pour God's love into our heart, I want to give you this simple little thought or simple little challenge to begin to, and this is, so, so pouring love into our heart is something that God does. But this is something that you and I can do. Philippians 4 verse 6 and 7 says, Be anxious for nothing. Remember, anxiety is a heart issue. But if in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which is, surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. One of the keys in that little phrase right there, your heart work, your homework, is with thanksgiving. Everybody say, with thanksgiving. You can determine the direction of your heart every day. Why, why, here's, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Take five minutes every day to stop and be thankful to God for all the good things. Because when you're thankful, you push out critical thoughts. Your heart struggles to engage in multiple things at the one time. So you replace critical with thankful. You, recra- you replace complaining with thankful. You, you replace negative with thankful. Not straight away, but that meditation on what you're thankful for transforms your heart and it allows the peace of God to come. So can we stand to our feet right now? Even those of you watching online, if you're able, why don't you stand to your feet right now? Just, just because it engages your physical body and it switches on that in, inner engagement. Close your eyes. I want you to think about God right now. I want you to pray this prayer after me. Say these words. Father, I ask you to pour your love into my heart through your Holy Spirit. I receive your love. Change my heart. Soften my heart. Fill me with your love. Jesus name Father I'm praying for every person listening right now you love them break down the hardness that blocks us receiving your love remove the obstacles so we can live a a life out of the knowledge of the love of our Father Would you take one minute right now and begin to just make the choice to thank God for something? Maybe it's five or six. Just what are you thankful for? Just meditate on those things. Thank God. Your thoughts matter to God. Thank you, God. Father, we thank you. I'm not going to say anything. Just while you thank God. Practice thankfulness. For the next 30 days as we do this journey together about the matters of the heart, would you every day ask God to fill you you with His love? And would you every day spend time meditating on the things that you're grateful for? I know it's going to help transform your heart, which will transform your life. For those of you in Melbourne right now, I want to say God bless you. I'm handing back to Ash. For those of you watching online today, I want to say God bless you. I'm handing back to Teresa.